Hey guys, Nerd King 101 here, and today I thought with Tom Taylor Superman finally kicking into high gear and all the coverage the character had been getting, I thought now would be a great time to take a deeper dive into the character of Jonathan Samuel Kent. But to do that, we need to go back in time to the 1930s. In 2021, DC Comics made the bold decision to allow Jonathan Samuel Kemp, the son of Superman, to inherit the mantle of Superman and become the main Superman of Earth. Now, for some context. Superman, Clark Kent, was created by Gary Siegel and Joe Schuster in 1939 and has basically been Superman for about 80 years now. There was a period in the 90s where multiple people held the mantle of Superman after being famous comic book, Death of Superman. But the most important thing to understand here is that this is a different scenario from in the 90s because Clark Kent, Kal El Krypton is still alive. He is in fact on War World, helping save surviving members of Krypton, and there's a whole separate story going on with him fighting the space conquering, war mongering, evil Mongol. Which is the first time Mongol's been in a story since what? For the man who has everything? I don't know, nobody uses Mongo anymore in any good way. But Superman is off world fighting Mongol, he's on War World, and there's a ton of awesome stuff going on with that book. And comic book superstar Tom Taylor was given the chance to write for Jonathan Samuel Kent. Now, Tom Taylor is a name some people may know, some people may not. He is responsible for the incredible multi volume Injustice series with fun out of the Injustice video game. He is, of course, known for his time on Deceased. He's done a lot. He's a big deal. He is currently writing, arguably, the best Nightwing run since, well, ever. I'm a big fan of Dick Grayson, but I haven't been this happy with the character since I became a fan of him. His run is fantastic. And when he was given Superman, many people were very optimistic. He'd written the character before both Clark and John. Mostly his big showing of his Superman, his real Superman, because of course he wrote evil Superman and Injustice. But the closest he ever got to writing a canon Superman was Deceit, where he was able to write both John and Clark as Superman in both Deceit and his sequel, Deceit Dead Planet. And many people were filled with immediate optimism upon this news. However, the character immediately came under heavy scrutiny when it was revealed that Superman, Jonathan Kent, would be coming out as bisexual, which is really the thing that got him in everybody's face. But the problem is that all these people talking about the fact that he is now, that Jonathan Kent had come out as bisexual, don't actually know anything about Jonathan Kent. Like, at all. You probably don't even know who that is, especially a lot of the people who are reading about it on news media. I know people in my own family who have asked me questions about this and not even known that the Superman in question wasn't Clark, which to me is wild. But I think that has a lot to do with news headlines not really specifying who you're talking about because they're correct when they say Superman is bisexual. Because John Kent is Superman. But John Kent is a completely original character. He was actually, probably to the surprise of many, only created within the last 10 years. Which is especially a shocker to people who associate him with Damian Wayne. Due to his appearance in Super Sons alongside the character in question of Damian. Now, I think the most important thing to fixate on here is that Jonathan Kent is a new character. But to understand Jonathan Kent, to understand how we got here, to this new character, the son of Superman, being 17 years old, coming out of bisexual, lighting up the comic book news media and the regular media in general, and finally giving Tom Taylor his chance to write his dream book of Superman, we need to go all the way back. We need to go back and understand how Jonathan Kent came to be, which means there's a lot of history to unpack. Because we have to go all the way back to the 1930s to fully understand the timeline of the events that led to the creation of Jonathan Samuel Kent, formerly Superboy, now Superman. 
Many famous elements of the character would not be there in Siegel and Schuster's original creation in Action Comics number one. However, some elements were. Superman was an immigrant. He was a champion of the oppressed. He was a very political character. And most of all, Lois Lane, the idea of Superman having a love interest, was there from day one which is quite different from many other comic book characters, especially early superhero characters. Siegel and Schuster knew they wanted Superman to have a love interest, and Superman and Lois would have the multiple dynamics over the many years of the character's existence, but for most of his existence, the dynamic most people are familiar with is, of course, that Clark Kent and Lois Lane were reporters at the Daily Planet. Lois was in love with Superman and didn't really like Clark Kent, even though they're the same person. And they would have on and off again romantic storylines throughout Superman's books for decades. Eventually, Lois Lane would figure out that the man who looks exactly like Superman with glasses and a suit on is, in fact, Superman. Her and Clark Kent would begin dating, and then eventually, after multiple decades, what if storylines, alternate universes, and Superman putting Lois Lane through hell in the 1950s, the decision was made to marry Superman and Lois. The two were married in the year 1996, almost a decade after Marvel set the precedent of marrying some of these characters and letting them evolve past their original relationships with the wedding of Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson. Fortunately for Lois and Clark, there's no Aunt Mays or Devils or Civil Wars to mess up this marriage. And the two would remain married for many years. They would remain married through multiple crises, identity crises, no man's land, the deaths of Superman, reign of many Superman, invasions of Darkseid, and countless good and bad stories, even some countdowns. But it was actually a Flash comic and an event and publishing initiative beginning in 2011 on August 31st that would be the greatest challenge for their relationship. Flashpoint was a DC Comics event written by Jeff John that saw Barry Allen, the Flash, go back in time to save his mother, alter the timeline and create a barbaric, hellish future in which Superman was never found by Jonathan and Martha Kent, Wonder Woman and Aquaman are leading Themyscira and Atlantis in a war, and Bruce Wayne was killed by Joe Chill instead, leading Martha Wayne to become the Joker, and Thomas Wayne to, of course, become Batman with guns who murders people. Due to how inaccessible DC Comics were at the time to new readers, the decision was made to use Flash to fix the timeline as an opportunity to reboot the universe and say all the stories began five years ago and create a blank slate where you could easily hop on without having to worry about the keys of continuity involved in reading the pre-Flashpoint storylines. DC called this initiative the New 52. The New 52 was to be quite frank and quite simple in you, a complete and other mess. From what fans have been able to gather over the years, there was no plan for New 52. Writers had no idea what was still canon, what they were allowed to use, who who was dead, who was alive. Some people didn't even know how long Superman and Batman had been superheroes at this point. It could have been five years, it could have been ten years, nobody really knew. Even the Flash's ability to remember the previous timeline was constantly in question. Not only this, but the reboot got rid of many things people enjoyed about the character. From losing fan favorite characters such as Wally West, Cassandra Cain, Stephanie Brown, to the removal of the relationship between Superman and Lois in favor of them attempting something new. By also removing the relationship between Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor, they decided to pair up Superman and Wonder Woman and put them in an ongoing series together entitled Superman and Wonder Woman. Not only this, but this new version of Superman was younger, wore Kryptonian armor with a really stupid high collar that nobody liked, and generally didn't act like the classical Superman that fans that have read a comic book for years have come to know and love. After multiple years of DC trying to make this work, an insane comic book shenanigans involving a story called Convergent, 
where they did a multiversal story involving the previous version of the timeline and multiple other universes, they made the decision to kill off New 52 Superman in favor of bringing over the Superman and Lois that fans were familiar with from the pre-Flashpoint timeline. However, earlier I briefly mentioned a storyline called Convergent in which multiple versions of characters from across the multiverse appeared in an epic story trying to fix many of the mistakes that DC created with the New 52. In one of the many Superman tie-ins to Convergent, we got to once again return to the lives of the pre-Flashpoint Lois and Clark. We're due to crazy comic book shenanigans, that version of Superman was depowered, and Superman and Lois were finally able to conceive and Lois was able to give birth to a child delivered by Flashpoint Batman in the Fortress of Solitude. This child that was delivered in the Fortress by Flashpoint Batman would of course be Jonathan Kent. Now this origin would get retconned multiple times in the future. Even in the first issue of Tom Taylor's Superman, this origin is retconned. But the important thing to note is that this is the first ever appearance of Jonathan Samuel Kent. Sometime after Convergence, as I mentioned, the decision was made to bring over the Clark Kent and Lois Lane from the pre-Flashpoint timeline that appeared in Convergence, as well as the baby they had in that storyline. They would live on Earth in hiding for some time before New 52 Superman was killed and Clark Kent from the pre-Flashpoint timeline would take over the mantle of Superman and essentially just be reinserted into the DC Universe to restore Superman to the way people liked him and also, in theory, re-canonize all the stories people missed. Except, of course, this also allowed them to upend the character in a completely new way. With the invention of Jonathan Kent, who was now aged up to be roughly 10 years old, Superman now has a son that he can raise and you would see the adventures of Superman attempting to raise his son in Peter J. Tomasi's critically acclaimed Superman Rebirth. This theory would explore Jonathan Kent as a child, learning about his power, going on adventure, and introducing him to the DC Universe, where during said series he would eventually meet Damian Wayne, the fifth and current Robin. The two became fast friends and would eventually co-star in another book written by Tomasi entitled Super Sun. And for a few years, this was the static quo of the Superman characters. However, eventually it came time for Tomasi to leave the title and the decision was made to hand over the Superman title to comic book extraordinaire Brian Michael Bendis. And to not get bogged down in incredibly complicated, pointless comic book craziness, Let's just say that Bendis' run on Superman was not well received at all due to multiple decisions, one of which was to focus far less on the family aspect of the character that had endeared so many people to Tomasi's Superman run. But the biggest one of them all was the decision to, through comic book shenanigans, time travel, and of course cosmic shenanigans, age up Jonathan Kent into a nearly adult male. This decision with the corpse met with heaps of backlash. Your people have been enjoying seeing John Kent grow up and seeing Superman as a father, and people were disheartened to see it be completely skipped over, to lose out on so many years of development for John and for Clark and for Lois too. Eventually, Jonathan would return from his time travel cosmic adventure, and he would be nearly an adult, and Brian Michael Bendick would leave the Superman book, creating a massive problem for anybody who took over the book, as they had this character in Jonathan Kent that nobody was happy with. So, in an attempt to really spice up the mantle of Superman, a decision was made to allow Jonathan Kent to become Superman in a book headlined by Tom Taylor. The first thing to do was to get Clark Kent off world, so we could focus entirely on Jonathan Kent, his relationship with members of the Justice League, and his role as Superman on Earth. So, the decision was made that Action Comics and Superman would be split between Clark and John. Clark would be off-world on War World fighting Mongol, while John would be on Earth taking over as Superman in the main title in a book called Superman, Son of Kal-El. Superman, Son of Kal-El hopes to tackle real-world issues and really focus on a question many people ask Superman as a character many times. Why doesn't Superman do X? Why doesn't Superman deal with dictators? Why doesn't Superman solve climate change? Why doesn't Superman do this? The decision was made to tackle that, to get pretty political for a comic book, 
and really focus on real world issues. But then somebody raised the question of doesn't he need a love interest? Superman has always had a love interest and is Johnny going to be Superman? He needs a love interest. And somewhere along the way, the decision was made to have that love interest be a guy. A meta-human reporter who stands up for what's right named Jay would must become Jonathan's version of Lois, a human character who can ground the book and really help pull John down from the sky as this all-powerful being who can do everything. Because it's been implied throughout the book that Jonathan may even be more powerful than Clark. And as mentioned, Jonathan doesn't really have any other friends. His other friends are either children that he used to go to school with before he was aged up by Bendis, or Damian Wayne, who was off fighting in a death tournament in his own Robin title. And unfortunately, it's also still 13 or 14 years old compared to Jonathan, who's now nearly 20. Jay feels like a perfect fit for the book, who aids Superman in his investigation when he is taking on a corrupt president who is oppressing and hurting his people, and it's also manipulating the media worldwide to make it appear as if they are not being oppressed, to make it harder for them to seek asylum in other countries. This same man is also targeting various metahumans, and Superman is also having his deal with the US military not properly treating some of the metahumans he has helped capture, particularly teenage metahumans who simply don't have full control of their abilities, being treated as stressed, and enemies of the United States. Jay, as a reporter, is able to really help humanize the book and help Jonathan gather information on the corrupt president whose name is in fact Bendix. If you've been following, that is indeed very similar to the name of the man who aged up John Ken, Brian Michael Bendix. However, due to the fact that Jonathan had been written to having crushes on girls during his childhood days before he was aged up, it was of course decided if he were going to have a relationship with Jay, he would of course need to be bisexual. This came at a time when DC was looking for more representation by creating new characters and having a few characters that haven't been doing much for the past few years come out. Other prominent character of course being the third Robin, Tim Drake, finally coming out of bisexual despite fans and writers implying it and theorizing on it for over two decades now. And to those who don't think there's anything there with Tim Drake, go back and read some of the old Young Justice Teen Titans stuff, especially with him and Connor. There's definitely something going on there. The decision to release a press statement was only due to the fact that the information about the decision to have Jonathan Kent come out was in fact being leaked, and DC wanted to be the ones to reveal the information themselves, as opposed to some YouTuber complaining on YouTube, or some Twitter or comic book blogger getting a scoop and being the one to foil the issue. If somebody was going to foil it, I guess they were going to be DC. And while it's indeed part of Superman's Son of Kal-El, it's no more prominent than Superman and Lois' relationship was in All-Star Superman, or any other book that focuses somewhat on Superman's romantic relationships. In fact, one would argue All-Star Superman, one of the greatest Superman comics of all time, focuses on Superman's romance with Lois far more than Son of Kal-El does on John's romance with Jay. The true criticism of the book that had been thrown around at the relationship with Jay had been that, as you may have noticed when I described him, Jay is a reporter who fights for truth, who aids Superman with his investigative prowess. In many ways, he's a more modern, teenage, hit the version of Lois that's male and have meta-human abilities. Leading to the criticism that Tom Taylor is just recreating Lois in a different, more diverse form in an attempt to just rewrite Superman dynamics. However, I would rager that the book focuses so much on what the core of Superman is. His compassion, his kindness, and his hope for the future that I really don't believe it matters. Superman, Son of Kal-El, the true return to form for the character of Superman that focuses on compassion, hope, and just Superman helping people. The main villain is an incredibly powerful politician. It's not an incredibly powerful businessman, but then again, Glass Luthor was literally based on Donald Trump after crisis. It's incredibly refreshing to see a Superman story that focuses on his hope, his compassion, and also has a villain that he can't just punch. The story focusing on Jonathan also allows the comic so once again, show the struggle of Superman learning to deal with an opponent he can't punch. Simple matter of the fact is that Clark had been dealing with Les Luthor for 
Gordon Yeager, Luthor literally became president in the early 2000s, making him the ultimate evil that can't be punned probably in the entire world. It's definitely easier to punch the rich businessman than it is to punch the president. With Tom Taylor's love of focusing on hope and positivity, Superman is the perfect character for him. And Jonathan Kent allows him to really stretch his creative wing and do his own thing with the character while also showing homage to a character that he clearly has massive respect and love for and referencing a ton of old stuff. His love of Jonathan, Lois, and Clark himself even in Clark's few appearances in the book, is clear. And as a massive fan of the Superman character, it brings me great joy to see the character return to a place of compassion, hope, and general kindness, and away from just Superman punching a hard rock monster clone of Doomsday a ton of time. If you enjoyed this video, please leave it a like. Tell me your thoughts on Tom Taylor's Superman Son of Kal-El in the comment section down below. And above all else, guys, have a great day.